Please open your Bible to Zechariah chapter number 13, where we're going to pick up our study in verse number 7. Earlier in the book, we were looking about false shepherds, bad shepherds, and how God judges them. This passage begins with God's shepherd and something that will happen to him. Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares he who is of the hosts. So here is God Almighty, God the Father, describing his beloved Son, the, the God who is in the bosom of the Father, how he is the shepherd of the people, but he is going to be struck down. This idea of the sword uh, having uh, the sense of execution and death. And that is borne out by the next part of the verse. It says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. That part of the verse is quoted in the New Testament Gospels, uh, Matthew and Mark. Let's just do the Matthew one. It is Jesus himself uh, who is preparing to go to the cross the next day. So it's the night of his betrayal. And he's been telling his disciples all sorts of things about what they need to be ready for his death and resurrection. And they've sung a hymn, and they're getting ready to go out to the Mount of Olives where he's going to be arrested. And in Matthew 26, 31, Jesus then said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, quote, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, end quote. But after I'm raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So Jesus was applying this prophetic passage to himself. He is the shepherd that will be struck down, killed. And his sheep, his little ones, his disciples are going to be scattered. Uh, They will be scared that night of his death and disappear. Now, thankfully, they will get back together again uh, and then become the leaders of the church. But the prophecy was fulfilled. So we know that this is related to the first coming of Jesus. The next few verses... I think, are likely to be connected with the second coming of Jesus, although we can't be 100% certain. Uh, Let's read them first. In the whole land, declares he who is, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, one-third shall be left alive. Now, that language sounds a little bit like the language of Ezekiel's prophecy in relationship to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. Uh, He was to take his own hair, cut it off, and then divide it into three parts. And he was supposed to do different things with those three parts to indicate what would happen to the Jewish people. Uh, Some of them were going to die one way and then another way, And then another group would be scattered all over the place and chased with a sword. Uh, So they were using thirds in order to indicate uh, the judgments that would happen to the Israeli people at the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, So some sense could be made of applying this verse to the destruction of Jerusalem after the death and uh, resurrection of Jesus, that the judgment that came in A.D. 70 may have included this idea of only one-third of the people uh, getting through that time uh, and then being refined over time. So there is some possibility of that having to do with it. But let me leave you with another possibility. We know that Jerusalem 
Judea is going to be ground zero for the activities of the two prophets, the two witnesses in Revelation chapter number 11, right before Jesus comes. And we know that there's going to be all sorts of things happen against those people, particularly after the two witnesses are killed. Uh, we're about to see some of the prophecies related to the collapse of Jerusalem uh, after the two witnesses are out of the way. Well, it could be that in all of that turmoil, these are the, um, the casualty percentages, uh, that two-thirds of those around the prophets will end up dead and only a third of them will get uh, out of that uh, after the protection of them is gone. Which is interesting because we know in the book of Revelation, when we start seeing some of the judgments, it is expressed in the fraction of a third, or a third of this, or a third of that, or a third of another thing. So perhaps uh, that is uh, the connection, is that this is all about what happens uh, in that last moment of time uh, between the death of the two prophets and the return of Jesus Christ, which is only about uh, a little over a week from their death to his return. Uh, but anyway, there's uh, this reminder, uh, again, in verse number nine, I'm going to put a th this third into the fire, refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. So that is a, it is a destructive process, we would say. It's a really harsh process, but its whole intention is to produce something of great value and purity. So God is intending to bring the best through that last confrontation. Uh, and then what will happen? They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, he who is, is our God. And so that's clear that they are in right relationship uh, after the persecution, after the winnowing process that is being described here. Which brings us then to the final chapter of this great prophetic book of Zechariah. And this chapter is unmistakably tied in with last things. The day of the Lord is specifically mentioned here, uh, as well as the second coming of Jesus from a uh, New Testament believer's viewpoint. So let's check it out. Chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for he who is, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. So it's going to be payback time. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And we know that right before Jesus comes, the ground zero for confrontation is there at Jerusalem. And we know from Revelation chapter 11 that the two witnesses are smack dab in the middle of it because they're there and are killed in the city where Jesus was killed says that very clearly in, in Revelation chapter 11. So we know Jerusalem is in mind. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city shall be taken, which I believe is a reference to what happens after the protection of the two witnesses is gone upon their death. The city is then overrun. The houses plundered, the women raped, not a very good scenario here. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So the city is overrun, and uh, anyone that was associated with uh, the Messiah, that is the coming Messiah, uh, are going to be dealt with apparently harshly. Verse number three, then... At that point in the story, he who is will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. So verse 3 tells us that this will trigger the Messiah showing up. 
So think Revelation chapter 19 now. Jesus on the white horse, arriving as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he has a sword, sharp sword coming out of his mouth, and he is going to wage war against these nations. Now, verse 4, we already talked about uh, because of the wording back in chapter number 12 uh, that caused me to start thinking of Jerusalem being the place where Armageddon takes place. Uh, just a real quick recap of that. Ar is uh, the word for mountain, har, and then Megidon with that O-N ending on it. That's a Hebrew participle for cutting or splitting. And so har Megadon is cut mountain or split mountain. And so here describes exactly that. Verse 4, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And we know that Jesus is returning to the Mount of Olives area. Pretty much uh, that's what the angels told the apostles uh, when they were watching him disappear on Ascension Day. Uh, 40 days after his resurrection and uh, 10 days before the birth of the church. This same Jesus that you saw going up into the clouds will be returning in the same way and evidently to the exact same spot. Uh, but that terrain will have been changed somewhat because of something that happens here. It says, The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. And it, it sounds as if it's an already done deal. Now, when might this happen? Uh, we know in the book of Revelation, chapter number 11, that after 1,260 days of prophesying, so that's just 10 days short of three and a half years on a Jewish calendar. So just 10 days short of a three and a half year period the two witnesses will then give their lives. Uh, their protection, their supernatural protection, will it will be taken away, and they will be overrun and killed. Their bodies will lie on the streets and will be watched uh, by all the peoples that counted them as enemies, uh, they'll be celebrating the death of these two individuals, these godly men, but what they consider enemies of the state. Uh, they'll even send presents to each other. A uh, happy dead prophet's day, that sort of thing. Uh, and for three and a half days, that's the situation. Then there will be a great earthquake, and the two witnesses will be resurrected and then ascendant instantly into the heavenly regions, uh, and that will leave only one week left in a three-and-a-half-year period, so one week before Jesus Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords. I think that earthquake, which is described in Revelation, is destroying a large portion of Jerusalem and killing a whole bunch of people. I think that earthquake is when the Mount of Olives splits. That's my opinion. And then the next thing that you see is that the uh, beast leader and the false prophet and the dragon, which is Satan, start gathering their forces in the place called Har Magidon, that is Split Mountain, uh, trying to barricade Jesus from arriving as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, uh, as described here in the book of, Revel uh, book of Zechariah and in the book of Revelation. Uh, so let's read again about this uh, splitting. It says, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. Uh, so we're going to have this, um, this gorge uh, that's the word that's used here, is for a, a nice, sharp, rugged, sharp-edged valley. So there's going to be this gorge that goes 
through the Mount of Olives and uh, from the Mount, uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, and this will connect uh, the Temple Mount to what will be eventually a river bed that descends into the Dead Sea area. Uh, so half of the mount will move northward and the other half southward. Uh, and it's an amazing thing to know this verse of Scripture here and to be standing probably right where the split happens. Uh, when we go to Israel, the overlook site uh, for the Temple Mount is almost due east uh, from the Temple Mount. And that's pretty much where I expect that this split will take place. Uh, and then... Look at this, verse number five. You shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to, reach to Azel. We don't know where that's at. It's somewhere in uh, the uh, wilderness of Judah leading down into the Dead Sea region. Uh, you shall flee as you fled in the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. There was a very famous earthquake back in his days, uh, and people were running away from the city of Jerusalem because there was so much damage. So when this earthquake presumably takes place uh, at the time of the resurrection of the two uh, witnesses uh, and the mountain splits in, in two uh, and this valley is opened up, some of those people that had probably been under the protection of the two witnesses and were now being hunted by the authorities that killed the two witnesses, they will see the chaos of that moment as the opportunity to run away from Jerusalem into this new valley and down into the Dead Sea area. And I would further speculate that they will probably hang a right once they get down uh, in, far enough and head for Edom, head for uh, the country that is south of the Dead Sea. Because there is another passage of Scripture that is tied in with the book of Revelation. It's an Old Testament passage, but it's tied in with the book of Revelation. Uh, that Jesus, when he arrives at Jerusalem, he will be coming from the direction of Edom, where he is engaged in a reprisal fight, uh, killing a whole bunch of his enemies. And so I've, I've su long suggested that some of these refugees mentioned here make it as far as ancient Edom when they are attacked by the forces of the beast leader. And that's when Jesus comes and puts a stop to that. Uh, and carries out his first reprisal uh, battle against the forces of the beast. And that's why he's covered in blood uh, in the book of Revelation chapter number 19 when he arrives. It talks about his robe being spattered in blood. Uh, then, and there's just no mistaking the point of this, uh, this is the end of verse 5, then he who is my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So that's Revelation 19 passage. Uh, Jesus arriving on his white horse uh, and all the saints and the angels of glory are arriving with him. The saints are dressed in white robes of righteousness and riding on their own horses in the sky. Just an amazing passage in the book of Revelation chapter 19 which is associated here, Zechariah 14, 5. Now, what about that day? That day of he who is, the day of the Lord. On that day, there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to he who is, neither day nor light, but at evening time there shall be light. What does it mean by that? It means that the second coming of Jesus is going to be like no other day in creation. It's not going to be too cold. It's not going to be too hot. It's not going to be dark. It's going to be light because the glory of God is there. Uh, it, will be, it will be 
never to be duplicated, never to be repeated, nothing like it in history. Then I love this next part, the prophecy about the river of life. On that day, what day? The second coming day. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea, that's the Dead Sea, half of them to the western sea, that's the Mediterranean. It shall continue in summer as in winter, meaning we're not talking about a wadi here. A wadi is a wet weather stream which runs very fast uh, with the winter rains and then dries up when summer heat comes on. No, this river is going to be continually supplied with water from an artesian-style spring on the, on the Temple Mount. So it will always be gushing and running. Uh, and some of it's going to go right straight through that new valley uh, into the Dead Sea area and make the Dead Sea area alive. How do we know that? Book of Ezekiel described that. Uh, and then some of it's going to be running the other direction, uh, toward the Med. Uh, book of Ezekiel, Book of Revelation, both describe how on each side of this river, uh, the tree of life starts growing. Uh, the, the forest of the tree of life springs up on either side of this river of the water of life. So this is the beginning of the new creation. Uh, we learn later in other passages, kind of cross-referencing with this, that at the second coming of Jesus, that's when the old heaven and old earth pass away with a great noise. Suddenly, it's destroyed, it's burned up with a great heat, but it's instantaneously replaced with a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness exists. And so this river is flowing from the brand new heaven and earth area of Jerusalem. And uh, everything has changed by this time. We'll actually see that there's great geophysical changes near Jerusalem. Verse number nine, definitely tie this into the book of Revelation. And he who is will be king over all the earth. On that day, he who is will be one and his name one. So we read in the book of Revelation that Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he rules and reigns with his saints, first for a thousand years and then for eternity, from Jerusalem. And so all of that is right here in the book of Zechariah as well. Then we get this description of the geophysical changes uh, that are associated with the city of Jerusalem. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba. Now, Geba is a few miles north of Jerusalem. And there are intervening hills and valleys between the Temple Mount and Geba. Well, that's going to change uh, in the new earth, in the time of the second coming of Jesus, where it's going to be like a plateau from Geba southward. Uh, so it's going to be, the whole land's going to be turned into a plain or a plateau from Geba to Rimon south of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly where this Rimon is. Uh, it may be somewhere down near Bethlehem. That would make good sense since Bethlehem is a few miles south of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. So this plateau area is going to change the face of the Middle East. It's going to change the face of Jerusalem so that Jerusalem is going to be the center of this plateau area uh, in uh, the New Earth. Uh, it says here, Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate. So the descriptions here are for those 
living in the time of Zechariah, who are seeing Jerusalem being rebuilt uh, in its old footprint. So Jerusalem of Jesus' return is going to have a similar footprint to ancient Jerusalem, but it's going to be much more flat, but lifted up on this plateau, since it's going to be a very special place uh, for the thousand years of the millennial kingdom. So Jerusalem's going to remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin, that's in the north, uh, to the place of the former gate, to the corner gate, that's the northeast, from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. Don't know exactly where those places are, but uh, they're probably part of the ancient footprint. And it shall be inhabited, for there will never again be a decree of utter destruction. So right there we know that this passage has to be fulfilled after our time period. Because the Jerusalem that was rebuilt in Zechariah's day was obliterated. It was erased. So that rebuilding that happened in Zechariah's day and after can't be the Jerusalem that's being prophesied here. So I, again, say it's got to do with the second coming Jerusalem. And then it says that Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Can there be anything more secure than what's described in the book of Revelation chapter 20 as the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he is king of kings and lord of lords, and he is ruling and reigning with his saints from Jerusalem. I can't think of another place that would be so secure Uh, and so peaceful. He will be the Prince of Peace ruling for a thousand years over the people of peace. And then the next thing that we'll come back to tomorrow is what will be taking place during that millennium for anyone foolish enough to try to stand up against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords seated on his throne at Jerusalem.